Hello YouTube. Today I'm the Naughty Librarian. I'm going over my mid-December wrap-up and doing my announcement for the Get Shit Done Readathon. It's a little different kind of video today because uh, first I am seated. Usually I stand in my videos, but uh, a lot of you follow me on social media so you already know that uh, I was in a really bad car accident and my knee uh, is all messed up. <laughs> I went into the dashboard of the car, so uh, I'm sitting with it up on a chair with an ice pack. Also, they did give me pain medicine, so I don't want to drink wine with that, so I'm just sticking to good old-fashioned caffeine. But regardless of all of those things, I still want to get this video filmed, so let's start off with talking about the Get Shit Done readathon. You may have already heard about this readathon, but essentially it's the most I don't give a fuck readathon that's ever been invented, and I'm truly really excited that I'm going to be co hosting it. The Get Shit Done readathon takes place starting January 1st, going all the way through January 31st. Essentially, the idea behind this readathon is to get some shit done. You know, it's a new year, New Year's resolutions, all that jazz. So basically, get some shit done, read a book. Whatever you want to read, essentially. But in case you are, you know, maybe lacking some inspiration, we have some prompts that'll help you pick things to get done. So here are the prompts. Number one, read a book from a subscription box. That could be from Book of the Month Club, for example, or, you know, Owl Crate or Fay Crate or, you know, all of those book boxes that we all see all the time. Read a book that you got in one of those that you still haven't read yet. Two, read a book that has been on your TBR list the longest, or just a long time in general. We all have that book on our shelf that's just sitting there and you read and you see it every day and you're just like, oh, I need to read that, and then you don't do it. January, now's the time to do that. <laughs> Number three, read a classic that you've been meaning to get to. Personally, I'm not the biggest fan of classics, but there are some classics that I haven't read yet that I feel like I should read. So that's kind of a... Uh, a one for me, I think, in particular, but yeah, I think a lot of people kind of uh, don't put as much effort into classics as we do to, into new releases, so if you want to read a classic, now's the time. Number four, finish a book you put down. We all have this problem where we start a book and then we get distracted for some reason or another and we put it down and then we just never come back to it. <laughs> January's the time to get that shit done. Open that book back up, finish it. Number five, start or end a series. So basically, if there's a series that you've always been wanting to read, maybe the whole thing's out already, time to start it. Or if there's a series you've read like three out of four books of, for example, read that fourth book, get it over with. Number six, read a book that you were sent for review or you were sent as a gift. So if you're a book reviewer, we all have those books like on NetGalley that get piled up. So hey, let's knock a few of those out. Or if you're not a book reviewer, and you are a bookish person, chances are someone gave you a book as a present and you haven't read it yet, so now's the time. Also, special bonus challenge is to read a book that accomplishes three or more of those criteria that I've already mentioned. So that's just a bonus and you can feel like an overachiever and get two gold stars on your turn paper. <laughs> this is the Get Shit Done Readathon. It's all about getting shit done, feeling good about yourself for getting some shit done. So I am really excited. You can choose to follow all of these prompts or none of these prompts. It's up to you what you wanna read. So I'm co-hosting this and my other hosts are Bethany from Beautifully Bookish Bethany, Mara from Books Like Woe, then I have Liana from Liana's Library and Jashana from Jashana C. I will link all of their channels down in the description below, but we are all co-hosting this little readathon. It's kind of fun. It's just, it's for grown-ups, you know? There's not a lot of strict rules. It's just like, yeah, just get some shit done, you know? Whatever. <laughs> But enough with the readathon, let's talk about the books I read in the first half of December. So this first half of December has been really rough <laughs> for a multitude of reasons, but I still managed to squeeze in seven books because your girl's a champion, the saying, you know. Hmm. I think overall, I really liked all of these. I didn't really have one in particular that I felt was bad, so I'm counting it as a win. Some I liked more than others, obviously, but you know, all, overall, I, I had a good time. I, I liked the books I read this month. So without further ado, let's get into the books I actually did read. First category is Paranormal Romance, and I read two of those. I read The Burning Shadow by Jennifer L. Armentrout, and this is a sequel to The Darkest Star, which was the first book of this spin-off series of the Lux series. That's a lot of backstory here, but basically the gist of the story here is angsty teen aliens having action in peril and, you know, evil government agencies. 
it's got everything I could ever want in an angsty teen alien romance. <laughs> and I know, like, it's not necessarily great literature. However, angsty teen aliens will never not be my thing. So this is just a book that I like just for its pulpy, campy factor. It's angsty teen aliens. Like, I keep saying that, but that's like the best way to describe it. And it's a spin-off. So we had five books of the original arc. This is a continuation of that series, but following different characters, essentially. So we're following Luke and Evie. Luke is a super powerful alien hybrid kid. And he was like a little kid in the first series, and now he's all grown up and apparently like the hottest thing on two legs. But <laughs> so it's Luke and there's Evie. And Evie is a girl with a mysterious past because, yes, you guessed it. Is there amnesia going on? Yeah, it's totally juicy and campy. I love it. <laughs> I don't want to say more than that because this is a sequel to the first book of the series where you find out more about Evie's, you know, the big reveal of Evie's past. So I don't want to say what that is just in case you haven't read The Darkest Star, but going in, you already know what the past was in this one, but we're still finding out more information. Also, this is taking place in a world that has been ravaged by a war. Basically, the, the Luxons came to Earth. It didn't go well. There was a big war. So now we're living post alien war and there's aliens living on earth and how humanity deals with that you know humans aren't always the best species in dealing with people that are different so um it's it's a very tense world environment in this book because there's humans and aliens living together and it doesn't always go great so there's also you know evil government agencies doing some creepy science shit and all this kind of stuff so it's very much x-files meets riverdale if i could, if i'm gonna like put into any type of context here it's just campy teen aliens in peril it had everything i wanted it to be essentially <laughs> so i gave it four stars i had a lot of fun reading this i devoured it i think i read it in like a day and a half it's just fun light read and, you know, action peril, teen angsty aliens. It's got everything I wanted. <laughs> Speaking of campy romances, I also read All I Want for Christmas is a Vampire by Carolyn Sparks. This is part of her Love at Stake series. It's not the first book of the series. It's like a random book of the series. I think it's like book five. I have not read books one through four. So going into this, just know that there is a lot of world building that I assume has already been established in the other books. But, um... I was able to pick up the world this exists in and who the characters are just fine, so it could be read as a standalone. It, it, it's a Christmas vampire story. Like, <laughs> it's just made for camp, essentially. And you know what else I didn't know about this book going in? The vampires? They wear kilts. They're Scottish vampires. What? Oh my gosh. Like, you guys have been watching the channel for a bit, you know, like I've been going through like a kilt phase at the moment. Like I'm getting really into Highlander books and I was like, okay, vampires, Christmas. And I'm like, oh, they're vampires wearing kilts. What? What? <laughs> so yeah, I like, I was so happy. I was like, oh, Merry Christmas to me. <laughs> and it has a lot of like funny, like rom-com tropes in it. I don't really particularly find it very funny. I don't think the humor in here is very clever, for example. It's kind of just like well-trodden rom-com stuff, which I don't mind, but it didn't have anything in there that was like, made me laugh out loud. I know there were jokes, but it wasn't like super funny. But uh, essentially we have Tony and Ian, and Tony is a human woman, and she doesn't really trust vampires. However, she is working for vampires as their daytime guard because, you know, they're literally dead during the day. And Ian is like a 500 year old Scottish vampire who just recently figured out he's a hot guy <laughs> and um, he's looking for true love in the big city. <laughs> One thing leads to another, he ends up on a dating website and uh, it blows up. It basically, it, everyone wants to date this guy and he's being hounded all the time. And it's just like, it's being played for laughs. So there's that like rom-com, funny bachelor-esque trope type of thing going on here. And also there's a lot of like peril and bad guy vampires fighting against good guy vampires, all amongst an all-star Christmas soundtrack. <laughs> and you know, like overall, I enjoyed it. Did I think it was the best thing I've ever read? No, I gave it like 3.25 stars. Like it was all right in the end. Um, there were some things that were like, somewhat problematic in it. Uh, for example, 
they like Tony and Ian are full on desperately in love with each other, and it's been like this. This book happens over the course of like a week and a half, like a week and a half, and you are desperately in love with each other. And mind you, they haven't spent that much time together because Ian is literally a corpse during the day. <laughs> like they spent like no time together, but like we're in love, and I'm like, you don't even know his middle name. <laughs> So there's that, but you know, it, it, it's a romance. You got to go with it at certain points. And also, um, I feel like I need to bring it up because it was so cringy when I was reading it. Mind you, this did come out in 2008, so it is over 10 years old. In 2008, these things should have been cringy as well, but I feel like in the, you know, the, through the lens of 2019, it's definitely cringy. There's a lot of dialogue in here that seems so stereotypical in regard to vampires of other races that I'm just like, Ooh. it's like a full body cringe at points. It's just like, no one else is talking like that. And then you have the one black vampire show up and he has like this, you know, stereotypical way of speaking that is just like, why? <laughs> you can throw a little flavor in it, but it seems like it's very problematic. Let's just say that. There's nothing in there that's like actively being bad, but it's just like cringy. You know what I mean? So just be aware going in. There are some cringy elements here, but the overall gist of the story, it's like Christmas in romance in vampires and kilts. Like, you know, I wasn't expecting the world here. <laughs> I, was, I got exactly what I wanted out of this, plus kilts. So Overall, I had a nice time reading it. It wasn't the best thing I've ever read, but it was it was cute. And there's a bit of smut in here too. There's a dash of smut. A dash. No, like there's like there's like a help a helping of smut. It's a more than a dash, but it's not like a ton. So it's like a helping of smut. So pretty steamy, pretty fun. Not the best thing I've ever read, but it was sufficiently Christmassy, so I had a good time with it. Next category is robots catching feels, and I read three of those. I'm very excited that I read Crier's War by Nina Varela. Basic idea here is that uh, there are robots and there are humans. I mean, they call the robots automata, but I don't want to have to keep saying automata, so I'm just going to refer to them as robots. <laughs> so in this world, humans invented the automata, aka robots, and the robots were around for a while as property, and they're like, mm, no thanks to you, we're going to overthrow you right now. So the robots do that, they have this huge war, the robots win, and now the robots are ruling the humans. And it's odd because the robots like then, you know, um, developed their world and culture based off of the humans they used to serve. So now you got robots living in a castle. There's a king robot. <laughs> in particular, we were following two girls in this one. There is Cryer, AKA Cryer's War. Cryer is the princess robot. Uh, she was created to be a certain way by her father, the king, and she is a princess. And she is most definitely a robot catching feels. For a lot of the book, she is very naive for a lot of things. She doesn't understand, you know, humans very well. She's lived a very sheltered life. And the thing that didn't bother me about her, because I had a lot of problems with naive naivete in books a lot of the time, but for her in particular, when she is naive and then she figures things out, she learns from it and then becomes less naive. So like she has like a learning curve here because she is very sheltered, but she does learn from her mistakes and she is thinking more. So she is becoming more and more feeling and human-like. Essentially, she's developing a lot more complex emotions than most automata feel. And then you have Ayla, who is a human girl who has a big chip on her shoulder. She has every reason to hate robots. The king, for example, sent out this raid to her human village and it killed her parents, so she's an orphan now. She hates robots. It has been her long dream in life to murder Lady Cryer to get back at the king. And the girls go on lots of adventures. This is a very uh, tense world they live in. Humans are tired of getting picked on by robots. Robots have won the war and ran with it. They're they're just as evil as humans were before the war. So there's a lot of things that you could say about corruption in here, but that's not really the point of the story. The point of the story, more so, is kind of a mystery and also it's an FF romance. So you have Cryer and Ayla figuring out, 
hey, we kind of like each other as more than friends. So you have a full on robot catch and feels and a human who has spent so much time hating everything and feeling guilty and all those emotions kind of figuring out maybe I don't want to kill Lady Cryer because she's not so bad. So you have these conflicting emotions going on at the same time and they also kind of develop feelings for each other. Now, it is a pretty slow burn romance in here. Um, like I said, Lady Cryer is very naive in figuring out how to feel. So obviously it's not going to progress very much. And I don't genuinely like slow burn romances. However, this one worked for a lot of reasons. And the nuances in these girls figuring out their feelings for each other, I thought were done in such a subtle, unique way that like I was there with them and I wanted to see them. I'm just, oh my gosh, just kiss, just kiss. <laughs> so um, I had a good time reading this. I genuinely really liked it. Did I think it was the best thing I've read this year? Honestly, no, but it is definitely unique. It's robots in a castle. The other tropes that are going on here, like we've seen before, you know, revenge stories. You're The king killed my family, so I'm out to get the king. Like, we've seen it a lot. However, it's particularly well written. I, I gave it four stars. I thought the writing was really quite good, even if, you know, it is a story we've seen before. But overall, I liked it. I thought it was pretty good. I recommend. It's, it's worth trying out. I definitely feel like it's a, definitely a YA story. I wouldn't call it as a crossover novel, but as an adult, I read it and enjoyed it. I thought the writing was good, so I do recommend. I also read The Kingdom by Jess Rothenberg. The best way to describe this book, it's kind of like Westworld meets Disneyland. Uh, in this world, there is a Disneyland-esque park, and in it, they have these um, cyborgs who are basically almost exactly human, but they are based on the Disney princesses, essentially. We are following Anna in particular. She's one of the princesses at the park, and her story is being told in two different time periods. There's the present, and then everything that leads up to the events that are happening in the present. So in the present, she is being tried for murder because there is a murder at the park and they think Anna did it. And then all the rest of the book is all the events leading up to the point where the murder would have happened. So you're kind of getting two different perspectives and two different versions of Anna. Anna in the beginning of the book is very much naive and doesn't really understand things. And then she starts catching feels and like learning and developing more. So there's also like a theme in the book, especially when you read the present day chapters where it's a trial, they're trying to prove Anna's sentience. Like is Anna actually a human like sentient being who can differentiate right and wrong? So that's also what they're trying to prove or disprove here. And throughout the course of the book, Anna is exploring her world and she keeps finding more and more sinister things. And from page one, the writing has this really interesting tone to it. There's this like rotten underbelly of everything that's happening and it, you feel it in the writing. Like something benign's happening, but you're like, how is this fucked up? Because I know it is. <laughs> but like I was saying, through Anna's story, she's finding out more and more about the park and her world and her place in it. And she also develops feelings for a human working in the park and the human reciprocates these feelings. And it's also a bit of a star-crossed lover's story a bit and uh, how this all leads to murder. <laughs> it's basically Westworld meets Disneyland is the best way to describe this book. And frankly, if someone told me there's a story that's Westworld meets Disneyland, I'd be like, yes, sign me up for Princess Murder Robots. I want that right now. So <laughs> that should sound awesome all on its own. And I do recommend it. I really, really liked it. I'm trying not to give away any like spoilers here because I really want to talk about some of them, but I'm going to hold back. But uh, yeah, I really enjoyed this. I gave it 4.5 stars. I, I thought they could have gone even darker in points essentially. So that's why I took off half a star. I'm like, oh, I wish they would have punched that up. It could have been like really dark in places that they kind of pulled their punches. Mind you, it is a YA book, so it makes sense. Because there is a lot of dark subject matter in here that happens off page but it's very obvious what's happening off page and I won't get into that but um you know it, there's some very dark things happening in this park so do I recommend this absolutely yes I loved it I thought it was really good last book featuring robots I read was War Girls by Tochi Anubuchi if you're going to pick this up I do recommend reading the author's note before reading the book because it actually explains a lot of things that I might not have picked up on 
and essentially this is um, a retelling of a real world events this actually happened but they put it in through the lens of in the future with robots and like spaceships and technology and all that stuff this is a retelling of the Biafran war which was real it happened in the late 60s early 70s in Nigeria and it started this horrible civil war with, you know, child soldiers and starvation and disease and famine and all of that horribleness that comes along with civil war. And it, it was really, you know, a rough period in history that we're not taught about, at least in the Western world that often. So I didn't really know about the Biafran War before I read this book, but it's an interesting take on retelling that story because now there's robots. <laughs> and you know what? I genuinely think this was very complex and while it could be for a YA audience, I feel like the level of moral ambiguity explored here really would appeal to a much more adult audience. It's one of those odd books that just like it could go either way. You could put this in the adult section and I think adults would pick up on it quite well. But uh, ooh, it is very dark. and. One thing in particular that really stood out for me in the writing was that uh, it would have been easy to pick a side in the war, you know what I mean? You could be on the Biafran side or you could be on the Nigerian side. You could have picked a side. And I feel like Tochi Anyabuchi actually doesn't pick a side. I mean, he comes from the Biafran side. I believe his mom was in the Biafran side of the war. So this is a very personal story for him. But like I was speaking about moral ambiguity because he really paints a picture of both the Biafrans and the Nigerians both being horrible to each other. This is a war story. There's not really heroes here. There's not a good guy or a bad guy. Both sides have good guys and bad guys, but both sides inevitably are just committing atrocities against each other. Mind you, the Nigerians probably are committing more atrocities toward the Biafrans because they simply have more resources to do so. But he also points out at times the Biafrans commit atrocities back. So it's not like one side is definitely like the scrappy hero who needs to like rise up against the dictator. They're both doing horrible things to each other. And that's like rare as far as far as moral ambiguity goes. There's a lot of narratives that pick a side and this one kind of doesn't. Both sides are really fucked up to each other and both sides are doing things that are horrible. Uh, there's child soldiers in this, for example. There, this is a war story. The whole book is a war story. And it's just atrocity after atrocity happening. Like the things that happen between people that are genuinely very similar in a civil war, like they all come from the same place, but how that just divides them and brings out everyone's worst characteristics about themselves. It's, it's very dark. Overall, I gave this four out of five stars. I thought it was very complex from a moral standpoint. Like I said, there's no really picking of sides here. Both sides are fucked up and doing horrible things to each other. And I also gave it four stars because the writing just felt very external. And I think that's a choice about how the story is being told. It feels like these are all things that are happening to the character, but we're not spending a lot of time thinking through the character's eyes. You know what I mean? We're not spending a lot of time in their character's thought process. We spend some time there, but I think the most of the story is happening externally of the character's like emotional state. So like I would have personally rather spent some more time in the character's brain rather than their environment around them but that's just how he chose to tell the story and it's not something I connected with all the time. It's very external when I wanted more internal dialogue here. But uh, whew, it is dark, it is morally ambiguous, and it's a war story. It's dark, it's war. So um, I do recommend though, Ooh, it is a dark story though, so just go in being prepared. <laughs> it's a war story, it is not like a happy ending really. I know there are more books in this series supposed to be coming out, but it's rough. It's a rough one. It's like kind of sci-fi Mad Max stuff, but also a retelling of something that actually happened. So I liked it. I thought it was pretty good. Last category is Book of the Month Club books, and I read two of those. So quick shameless self-promotion for a moment. I'm actually a Book of the Month Club affiliate, and that means I have a link down below. If you ever wanted to try out Book of the Month Club, if you use my link and you sign up, 
you know, perhaps they do nice things for me too, so we're both getting something out of it. I genuinely think it's a dope service. If you ever wanted to try it out, it's almost Christmas, if you want to give it as a gift, my link is down in the description down below. Okay, shameless self-promotion is over for a minute here. Let me get into the books I read this month. I read Bringing Down the Duke by Evie Dunmore. And I'll tell you right now, this book surprised me in many ways. First of all, it is a book made of tropes that I normally hate, and yet it worked for me. Like, I genuinely really, really liked this. I was, I was shocked. I'm still a little shocked that I liked this as much as I did. <laughs> it's a slow burn, slow paced historical, and it's not funny. It's a drama. So I'm just like, how did I like this? <laughs> Like, I, it, I'm, I, I, I'm beside myself. I'm speechless about how much I liked it. it. It shouldn't have worked for me, and yet it worked. So I think that comes down just to the writing. This one is about Annabelle and Montgomery. Mind you, these are two of the most Victorian names I have ever heard together. <laughs> so Annabelle is one of the first female students at Oxford, and she's kind of being sponsored to be there by the women's suffrage movement. And part of that entails Annabelle helping the cause, and that includes them going up to, you know, important men and saying like, hey, you know, women should have rights, right? <laughs> and uh, trying to convince them to support the cause as well. Annabelle is new in town, doesn't know who people are. So she goes up to this one guy. She's like, oh, that guy looks important. I'll go talk to him. And it's Montgomery. Turns out Montgomery is a duke. And everyone at the movements is like, you talk to the duke? You're ballsy. That's your job now. Go get him. And he's And she's like, but but he's a jerk. <laughs> so hence you have this kind of antagonistic relationship. And honestly, their relationship was giving me Elizabeth and Darcy vibes. And I was just like living my Jane Austen fantasy right now. And especially it was better for me than Jane Austen books because this one actually has some smut in it. So it's Jane Austen plus smut. Yes, love. <laughs> so they have like this kind of bickering back and forth personality thing like Elizabeth and Darcy and there's so many like Victorian era romance tropes in this like um Montgomery offends Annabelle and she leaves the house in the middle of winter and he has to go find her because he doesn't want her to die in the snow so you know he like he goes after her on a big stallion so it's just like a guy in breeches on a stallion <laughs> looking for the girl in the snow and I'm like oh my gosh all of the bodices in the world just ripped <laughs> so basically I was just like living the fantasy with this one it's very Jane Austen plus smut and also women's suffrage movement and I genuinely really liked it. I liked the characters. I liked the relationship to each other. I I liked a lot about this. It was surprising because it's made of things that I don't normally like. It's slow burn, for example. It takes them a long time to get together. They do though, and there's a bit of smut, so there's that. It's also slow pace, you know, it's Victorian era. Nothing's happening at a quick pace in here because, you know, they don't got phones. <laughs> they gotta like walk across town to deliver a note and then like someone has to receive the note and everything has a million buttons on it, you know, like very slow paced. And it's not particularly a comedy, you know, I think it's more of a drama definitely. There are some parts of it that are funny. There's a few jokes in here, here and there, but I don't think it's supposed to be a necessarily a comedy comedy. There's not a lot of laugh out loud bits in here. So it's made of things I don't normally like, but yet it was so well written and I was living my full smutty Jane Austen fantasy that I genuinely enjoyed it quite a bit. <laughs> so I had fun with this one. I recommend. It's a quick read. I read it all in one day. It's real short and it's fun. So I recommend. I had a good time with it. The last book I read in the first half of the month was The Guinevere Deception by Kirsten White. So, you know what, I'm just gonna go into this kind of bias because I love Kirsten White. She writes really good historical stuff. I like a lot of her books. And then she's writing about Camelot. I kind of really like Camelot stories. So I'm going into this with a fair bias that I'm probably already gonna like it. But that being said, there are a few surprises here. For example, The Guinevere Deception is about Guinevere being the main character. And Guinevere is actually a changeling. She is not the real Guinevere. Guinevere died. The girl in here has become Guinevere at request of Merlin because he's like, hey, girl, you're Guinevere now. Go marry Arthur because Arthur, he's gonna get himself killed by magic. He's not doing well. You gotta protect him. You're a bodyguard now. So she goes to Camelot, she marries Arthur. Arthur's in on it and he's like, oh, you're a bodyguard, cool. Do you do magic and stuff? And she's like, 
fucking yeah. <laughs> so they have like this kind of little bit of flirtatious relationship. There's like potential there for more. And she's basically there as like an undercover agent. So already I'm like, okay, you're playing with some tropes. I like it. It's definitely a YA story, which isn't a problem. It's still written very well. I'm an adult and I enjoyed it. But the other side of the coin is, as an adult who knows the Camelot characters and the story a little bit, all of the twists in here, I'm like, yeah, fucking duh. <laughs> because I know who the characters are. There's characters in here that, um, I don't want to say just in case other people don't know the Camelot story, but there's characters in here that I already know are the bad guys. But they're not being played as bad guys in the beginning of the book. And I'm like, where's the twist? Where are they going to become the bad guy? And I'm like, oh, there it is, because they're the bad guy, obviously. So if you know a lot about the Camelot story and who the major players are, the twists aren't going to be a surprise for you. You're gonna be like, yeah, fucking duh. <laughs> so there is that. They are playing a little bit with gender roles in this. And uh, there's cool magic. There's a lot of wild and almost decaying type of magic in here that I thought was interesting. The, the magic system's pretty cool. And uh, overall, I genuinely enjoyed it, but I think that's mainly just because I really, really like Kirsten White as an author, because hot damn does she write the shit out of this. It is so good. The prose is just gorgeous, and it feels magical in this weird, wild, medieval kind of way. She just has this really lyrical, beautiful writing style, so it's so well written. I loved it to bits, even though I already knew all of the twists that were coming, because Camelot is well-trodden material at this point, but I think if you don't know the Camelot story or who the major players are, or, you know, you are a YA audience member who, you know, this book is written for, you're not going to see the twist coming. You're going to love it. So I was looking through it through that, you know, guise as well that, you know, if I didn't know, would I have been surprised? Probably so. You know, it depends on the audience here. Me, I'm an adult who knows the Camelot story, so I'm not so really surprised by twists, but... If I was a teen who didn't know the story, I'd probably be pretty surprised. So there's that. <laughs> oh man, she just wrote the shit out of it. That's all I can say. I mean, it's a Camelot story. It's got magic. It's got knights. It's got peril. It's got, you know, cool stuff like that. And also, you know, it's, it's, it's Camelot. And it's really well written. It's so beautifully written that I, I recommend as an adult, just don't mind that you already know who the characters are. It's so well written that I don't think you're gonna mind because you're like, oh man, that was beautifully done. <laughs> so props for that. I gave it four stars just because it is a YA story and I obviously know the story already, but she can't really get around that at this point. It's been around for a while. So, you know, it's not really her fault. She wrote the shit out of it. It's very good, but you know, not surprising. Four stars. So I feel like I've been talking for quite a long time at this point, <laughs> but I did read seven books. So that's pretty good in uh, the first half of the month. Knock those books out, doing great, doing the most. And um, also don't forget about the Get Shit Done readathon. You can start thinking about your TBR list. Honestly, it's an I don't give a fuck readathon. So basically you can read whatever the hell you want to read. Personally, have not figured out what I want to read yet because I haven't done my January TBR, but I'm gonna do that soon. <laughs> but mind you, it's just about getting shit done and feeling good about yourself for accomplishing something. So it's up to you how much you read, how little you read, what you read. It's very laissez-faire. Let me know in the comments down below. Uh, have you read any of these books? And if you did, did you love them? Did you hate them? Uh, also let me know, hey, do you wanna take part in the Get Shit Done Readathon? Let me know in the comments down below. If you like this video, make sure you give it a like. And if you want to see more videos, make sure you subscribe. And I'll see you guys soon. Bye! I would get up and touch the camera, but I'm sitting here with an ice pack, so that's not happening. <laughs>